in chess. There are two types of openings, system, and non-system. System openings are universal, meaning once you've mastered one, you can rely on it, against nearly anything your opponent throws at you, but among all of them, perhaps the most versatile, is the king's Indian defense. An opening so adaptable, you can unleash it against d4, the English, the ready, even the Dutch. You can even flip the board, and play it with the white pieces. But there's a catch. I think anybody below like 1600 or so shouldn't even consider playing the King's Indian because it, you can't break the rules until you've learned them. You need to spend some time learning the rules. The King's Indian breaks one of chess's most fundamental opening principles. In fact, learning it is said to have serious consequences for your growth as an intermediate chess player. So, if you're someone who doesn't like being told what to do, even by grandmasters, I've prepared three insane model games to explore. Together, we'll study how elite players break basic opening principles, witness jaw-dropping calculation from the greatest American to ever live, and, by popular demand, we'll wrap up by analyzing a wild King's Indian game between two ferocious 1000 rated players. I'm mortal chess, this is nothing special. I'm just taking over the world of chess. And I'm doing so using a trashy robot voice. Knight f3, knight f6, and c4 is on the board. On the white pieces is Vladimir Kromnik a three-time world chess champion, whose genius way of staying relevant in the chess world today is by accusing basically everyone of cheating. He says that Hikaru Nakamura's online performance against the best players in the world is mathematically impossible. A bold claim backed by a degree in statistics he got, from the University of YouTube. A few moves are made and after e4, you realize something odd, Black hasn't made a single pawn move in the center. Black is Hikaru Nakamura. Because if I say Hikaru Nakamura is Black, some of y'all will lose it in the comments. Anyway, the year is 2011, 13 years before the vile cheating accusations, the move is d6, and after d4 and castles, the opening is the king's Indian defense, the fundamental chess principle broken, is one where, in the opening, you always fight for the center with your pawns. A principle that led to the popularity of classical openings like e4 e5 and d4 d5, where both sides stake equal claims to the center. But the king's Indian is a hypermodern chess opening, part of a group of openings bound together by the philosophy that, pieces are just as effective at controlling the center as pawns. This philosophy was revolutionized around 1914 by chess heroes like Reddy and Nimsevich in the comfort of their offices, while brave men were deep in the trenches fighting for human rights. Well, they were fighting for land, but that's beside the point. The idea is to let your opponent build as big a center as he wants, and then later, with moves like e5, you use a combination of pawns and pieces to attack white's center. It may seem like this pawn isn't sufficiently protected, and a series of captures followed by knight takes e5 simply wins a pawn, but that is where black's hypermodern piece control of the center shows its power. Because knight takes e4 wins back the pawn, and after the exchanges on the knight, white's massive center is all but destroyed. This hypermodern style led to the success of openings like the perk, the Grunfeld, the Queen's Indian, the Nimzo Indian, and perhaps the most modern of all hypermodern chess openings, the Nimzo Zimbabwean defense. Look at the massive minor and major piece inspired central control. It's undefeated for a reason, but the year is 2011, and Vladimir Kromnik is well aware of the power of hypermodern openings. He ignores the central conflicts by castling, Nakamura moves his knight to put more pressure on the center, and finally, Kromnik goes for d5, to which Nakamura responds with knight e7. The tension in the center is released, and the pawns are now interlocked. All opening strategies and philosophies step aside, making way for the middle game, which in my opinion, is the most fun stage of a chess game. But what are black's plans, and what are white's plans in this position? Pawns. They dictate your plans of attack in a given position. They make up the landscape or terrain in which you are fighting. It can be a desert, where your heavy artillery will be the most important weapon, or it can be a dense jungle, where your ninja assassins become your most important asset. Or it can be an interlocked pawn chain like this one, where your mission is to throw all you have in the kitchen sink, at your opponent's kingside. White, on the other side of the wall, has to throw all he has at black's queenside. So knight d2 is played by Kromnik, slowly directing his pieces towards the queenside. Black responds with a5, a prophylactic move, discouraging white's queenside expansion. I personally would be going all out on the kingside, but Hikaru is a defensive genius. I'm betting he knows what he's doing or he's cheating of course, as per Kromnik's statistically backed observations. Who I do envy by the way. He can accuse the whole world of cheating and nothing happens to him. But if I accuse one person of cheating, my wife, I lose half of everything I own, 
She will take my kids, and worst of all, she may even take my dog. Anyway, Kromnik plays a3 preparing before, after which Nakamura plays king g8 which at the moment, is above my understanding of chess. Rook b1 is another move that prepares before and it is met by knight d7, preparing f5. Both pawn advances occur, and after f3 and f4, this wall of pawns makes it clear what the plans are. Kromnik plays knight b5, an ideal square for the knight because not only is it safe there, it also puts pressure on the squares that, after moves like c5, are usually targets in the king's Indian structure. That's why Hikaru responds with b6, discouraging c5. This skillful balance between defense and attack, is subtle GM level play, that often goes unnoticed by us average spectators. Queen c2 was Kromnik's way of forcing the c5 issue, but since it's 3 versus 2, he still needs one more piece looking at the c5 square, like a knight on b3 for example. So can you guess what Hikaru played? a4. Congratulations, you have super grandmaster IQ. So, why did you vote for J- Anyway? Kromnik brings another piece to the queen side, and Nakamura advances with g5. The idea is to ruin white's kingside structure with g4, so Kromnik stops it by playing g4 himself. I know what you're thinking, but that move isn't forced. The best move in this position is h5. You can tell Nakamura wants to destroy the kingside structure and infiltrate with heavy pieces. Kromnik maintains the integrity of his kingside structure by protecting g4 with h3, so Nakamura intelligently plays rook f6. The idea is to bring a rook to the soon to be open h file. Rooks belong on open files, a principle that is simple and will never change. But in grandmaster games, it's often hidden behind complex moves and maneuvers, like when you go on a date. You know you only want one thing from her, but your intentions have to be hidden behind mundane conversations about pets, and horoscopes. Who the hell cares about horoscopes? But that's high level game, you do what you have to do to get your rook, into that open file, if you know what I mean. This is mortal chess, the only chess channel that gives dating advice. After bishop g2 and rook h6, white plays king g2, preparing to bring his rook to challenge Hikaru's on the h file. One attacking blow by black is followed by a defensive move. Nakamura is proving that in the king's Indian, it's not all about seeing red and going straight for your opponent's throat. There's always a sophisticated way to play a barbaric opening. King g2, sometimes the king just runs away to safety, but after knight f6, Kromnik suddenly gets a boost of adrenaline, and lashes out with c5, sacrificing a pawn to get things moving on the queen side. After takes and knight c4, Hikaru plays bishop d6, consolidating his dark square structure. White responds with forming a battery aimed at e5, and after takes and takes, black plays queen e7, protecting his e5 weakness. White's attack is starting to take shape, but will he regret giving Nakamura an extra pawn? Which is now a passed pawn by the way, protected by the rook. We will find out in the next few moves. But what is clear is that black is now on the defensive and white is playing for checkmate. If he doesn't get it, he'll lose to black's material superiority in the endgame. Bishop d7 is played, threatening the knight, and surprisingly, this is move 30, and knight takes d6 is the first piece captured in the game. The king's Indian is an insane opening. Black captures the knight, and Kromnik plays h4. He wants to blast the kingside open, combining the aggression of his pawns with his rooks and the queen bishop battery to hunt down black's king. But Hikaru finds an insane resource in this position. He allows takes and takes, opening up the h file, but then whips out knight takes e4 check, a piece sacrifice. After takes takes, and takes, he's a piece down, but he has two passed pawns. Pardon me, three passed pawns and after f3, Vladimir Kromnik is in huge trouble. He captures on b6, hitting the rook, but Nakamura is a shark, and he smells blood on the board. g4 check. The pawn is poisoned, because after takes, queen takes check, and after king takes, rook f8 is checkmate. Kromnik captures the f pawn instead, and the black pieces take his king for a walk. At the end of this sequence, rook f2 pins the bishop to the king. Kromnik plays bishop d2, hitting black's queen, only to get that bishop pinned again after rook takes f2. Queen c3 is played, protecting the bishop, but the following moves remind us that Nakamura still has two passed pawns in the position. King c1 is played, breaking the pin, and Nakamura gives Kromnik the exchange, following it up with a cheeky move, a2. The queen can't capture because she's pinned to her king, but if queen takes queen, a1 equals queen and Nakamura captures the rook on the next move. Instead of resigning and reporting, Kromnik played a depressing king c1, but after takes takes, and the painful move bishop f1, how are you stopping this promotion? 
Kromnik resigned, a loss that marked the beginning of the dominance of a new age of players, players who have been at the top until about now. I think this will be the year this group of kids takes over, but it remains to be seen who will defeat this guy. The greatest chess player of all time, the GOAT, but only for people who haven't really studied Bobby Fischer. Let me know if this game changes your mind. E4 is on the board, and E6 is the French defense. Bobby Fischer with the white pieces, plays D3, a move that usually signals that white will be playing the king's Indian attack. Black responds with D5, an important move in the French defense. The idea is to play knight D2, protecting the E4 square. Black plays knight F6, putting more pressure on the center, to which white responds with G3, preparing bishop G2, followed by C5, a move that usually brings a smile to a French or Karo Khan player's face. It gives them the sense that they have achieved something, even though it's only move 5 of the game. Fischer replies with bishop g2 setting up his kingside finchetto. The move order is slightly different from the previous game, but the middle game ideas are somewhat similar. The knights are developed, and after black plays bishop e7, both sides castle. This is round 3 of an infamous tournament in Susa, Tunisia 1967, where Bobby Fischer's usual behavior was on steroids. He fought with the officials and complained about the lights from a chandelier, and the noise made by cameras during the game, one of which he threatened to smash in front of a reporter. As awful as his personality was, he had the body to back it up, Fisher was a 6 foot 5 behemoth. But as far as chess was concerned, he was wiping the floor with everyone, and with the move E5, his opponent, who I won't disrespect by having this awful voice pronounce his name, was in for a tough game. Knight D7 attacks the pawn, and Fisher defends with rook E1. B5 is played by black, his plan is to attack on the queen side, and with the following moves, it becomes clear that Fisher is launching an attack on the king side. No defense, it's attack versus attack, the chess equivalent of a hockey fight. Anyway, after a5, Fisher played bishop f4, adding extra protection to a very important pawn in the king's Indian attack. A pawn on e5 is worth a point and a half in attack. I think Kasparov said that. It gains kingside space and removes the key defender of black's king from the f6 square. But after a4, it seems Black's attack will be landing sooner than White's, so Fisher takes the time to play a3 because, after takes takes, like what happened in the game, the pawn advance is brought to a halt. The next few moves are the players fighting for the c4 square, but with the move knight g5, Fisher yields and focuses on his kingside attack. That's chess principle, you want to play on the side where you are strongest, and this move also opens up the possibility of the queen jumping over to h5, with deadly threats. Knight a5 is played, hitting the bishop, which retreats to d2, and only then is the knight on g5 captured, followed by queen d7. There is a subtle tempo game being played here, which you may have missed. In this position, if black instantly captures on g5, notice that he is now a move behind than in this position, with white to play. It may not be easy to appreciate, but gaining moves, or tempo, is very important in grandmaster level games. Unlike in your games, where you might use the extra move to, hang your queen for example, Anyway Fisher finds a deadly square to place his queen. After rook h8, the knight begins its journey to black's kingside to aid the attack. But after knight c3, the sorcery begins. Bishop f6 is played by Bobby Fisher, a shocking move. A shocking move backed by world champion level calculation. Because after takes takes, Fisher is threatening check and checkmate. The move king h8 makes way for the rook to come and defend on g8, but now bishop f5, hits harder than your uncle's HIV entering your system, because if captured, rook e7 hits the queen, then captures this pawn, and it is game over. Fisher saw all of this before playing bishop f6. Think about it. It's an exercise in humility, to realize that there are people who have long lived and died, probably never owned an iPhone, and some of them did not live long enough to see the internet, but they are all 100 times better than me at this thing to which I've dedicated a significant portion of my life. If that's not humbling, I don't know what is. Queen e8 was black's answer, intending to meet the mating threat of queen g5 with queen f8. The knight continues its journey towards black's king, but after g6 and queen g5, black decides to get rid of it, knight takes. But instead of pawn takes, Fisher takes back with the rook. If you're anywhere near my strength in chess, you're already thinking about moves like h5 and rook h4. But do you have the guts to do it like Bobby Fisher? Because c4 is met with h5, pawn takes c3 is met with rook h4. Fisher is ignoring his queenside like it's climate change. That's how much faith he has in his attack, and if you are Bobby Fisher's opponent, you better have faith in his attack too. 
Rook a7 was played, providing lateral defense of black's kingside, but bishop g2 is Bobby Fischer's reply, completely ignoring the queenside, re-maneuvering his bishop, and going for the direct kill. That is the essence of King's Indian philosophy, seek, and destroy. But you have to be a special kind of person to play this opening. If you've ever uttered the word safe space, microaggression, or almond milk, try the London system, it's an IQ-friendly, slow opening, which is nothing like its name, the stabbing capital of the world. Pawn takes c2 is a passed pawn, one move away from castling, protected by the rook. That's enough to send a chill down the spine of any chess player, but queen h6, Bobby Fischer is unfazed. His only terror is the light emanating from the chandelier and the sound made by the reporter's camera. Queen f8 defends the very obvious checkmate threat, but then Fischer uncorks an insane move. You can pause the video if you want to buy a ticket to the dopamine lottery, but the move was queen takes h7 exclamation. Double exclamation blue check mark, and an eggplant emoji for those of us who have an uncle, and are familiar with what's happening to black in this position. King takes is forced, after which pawn takes g6 double check, forces king takes pawn, followed by bishop e4 checkmate. Bobby Fischer was on fire in this tournament, he played the king's Indian, destroyed every chess player they put in front of him, and then, in the final rounds, withdrew from the tournament. Not because of the chandelier, not because of the camera, but because of his newfound faith in the Protestant church. A faith that did not allow him to play on Fridays or Saturdays. Funny enough, the tournament officials and organizers bent the rules and moved Fisher's Friday and Saturday games to a later date, but logically, this meant Bobby Fisher now had a tight schedule of tough games against strong players at the money end of the tournament, which for Fisher was a great opportunity to throw a huge temper tantrum at the officials, after which they told him politely, to f*** off. This is the kind of drama we deserve as spectators of the game of chess. Robert James Fisher for me, is the GOAT. But on the other end of the spectrum is 500 LO Chess, where low IQ meets high testosterone, and the following opening moves confirm the opening in which this intense battle will be fought. The King's Indian Defense. Oliver Oliver, with the white pieces, has taken full control of the center, and Cowboy Baby, on the other hand, is very happy to be black in this game. I know this because of the gang sign next to You know what, this is why I'm not getting any sponsorship offers on this channel. Send a few bucks to my PayPal, please. Anyway, knight f3 and castles is on the board. These 500s are playing first line king's Indian defense theory. These opening moves might have you convinced you are watching Magnus Carlsen versus Hikaru Nakamura in the fighty candidates, that is until moves like h3 enter the chat. In this position, Mr. Cowboy Baby recalls that after developing his pieces, he must strike at the center with the move e5, and he does just that. At 500 elo level, the instructions of a YouTube video are followed word for word, even at the expense of a bishop. But after takes takes, both sides are out of prep and are now thinking on their own. This is where it gets interesting. Black plays knight e5, threatening the pawn on g4 and in response white retreats his bishop. To c2, and not e2. Because that would be a decent move. We don't do that here. Knight takes is followed by knight f3, the top engine move, preventing the infiltration of the queen via the g5 square but I think Mr. Oliver just wanted to capture the knight on e5, and Mr. Cowboy Baby responds with f5, another one of those thematic king's Indian moves recommended by the YouTube video, because after takes takes, all it does is ruin your kingside shelter, but white was dead set on capturing the knight. He is a piece up and he is seeking trades. Can you blame him? Knight takes e5, and pawn takes e5 as the response, a terrible move. Because do you really want to give your opponent the opportunity to trade queens when you're down in material? But after knight d5, perhaps a more important question is, is there a game or sport where, in a single move or play, you can go from totally winning, to dead lost? Chess leaves a special kind of damage on one's soul, because believe it or not, the best move for white here is to sacrifice the queen for this knight. The threat is simple, queen h2 checkmate. The move queen f3 by white is played with the hope and prayer that black will somehow forget why he brought his queen to h4. Not today sir. Queen h2 checkmate brings us to the end of a video in which I tried to help you understand the background and philosophy, of an opening I hold near and dear to my heart. An opening I started playing when I was way below 1600 LO, and I turned out just fine, but only because I used a methodical approach, which I explained deeply in this video. So leave a like, and let's meet on the other side.